real life stories to bring awareness to domestic violence, human trafficking, and systemic corruption. Welcome to our podcasts and lives. We are so happy that you joined us and hope that you like and follow us and would love for you to share your thoughts in the comments below. Our videos are for information purposes only and any accusations are alleged and less found guilty in a court of law. Let the show begin. Our story started in Colorado. Um, we, me and my husband and our two children, um, we were living in Colorado and there wasn't the best of places for us to stay except for my biological family. Uh, my grandma and grandpa's house. And uh, while we were staying there, um, there was a number of calls, anonymous calls reported on us uh, to the CPS uh, tip line. And we didn't know about that until a caseworker showed up uh, to my grandparents' house and was all like, well, we got a report of possible sexual abuse and the conditions of this house and drugs and stuff like that and me and my husband were like no this isn't true and she goes well I'm gonna safety plan uh, with you guys and she had that you know that demeanor of threatening like if you don't do this it's gonna turn out bad um, and so Did we you do got any kind of an investigation at all before coming up with her, her plan of attack there? No, she did not. She just came in. And at that time, me and my husband didn't know our rights. We didn't know that we were able to refuse her coming into the house and talking to us. And so we were like, yeah, she, uh, she, she came in and she's all like, well, this is the reports that I've gotten. What's your side? And and we told her, you know, that's not true. Freaking if there was any of that going on, we would have found someplace else to stay. Um, and she's like, well, I'm just letting you know what's uh, reported and I need to, um, you know, find out what's going on. And so I was like, okay. And my stepdad, he came in and, um, cause that, that's what the allegations were on with the sexual abuse was that my stepdad was, um, uh, doing that to my, do our daughter and he, he got immediately mad, which is understandable if somebody is accusing you of doing that. And so he went off like a rocket on the caseworker. And so she safety planned him out of the house. He had to go stay at the motel that he works at. Um, and so we thought that was all good and dandy. Well, I guess there was some more calls that came in uh, regarding you know, that he was sneaking in at the house. And when I heard about this, we're like, no, he hasn't been here. He's hasn't snuck in. And she's like, well, I can't guarantee um, that he's not sneaking in in the middle of the night to the house. So you guys need to move to a homeless shelter. And so we, oh yeah, we went to their right. homeless shelter. Yeah. She said that we needed to go to the homeless shelter uh, and we had two hours to uh, gather up our stuff to go to the homeless shelter. And this was in, I think, January of 2020. And so we, you know, gathered up our stuff and we went to the homeless shelter. You know, there was bed bugs at that homeless shelter. There was people coming in that were drug addicts and alcoholics. Uh, myself, I don't have that much of a immune system and so i was getting sick a lot because of how dirty this homeless shelter was our daughter and son were sick three times uh where they had to go to the hospital the er my our daughter came down with hand foot and mouth disease while at the um the shelter and so we were sitting there like okay this isn't working and so and we my husband had his service dog with him and the staff they told him that he needed to get rid of it, uh, get rid of the dog and um 
and my husband was like, no, this is my service dog. And they're like, well, you need to get rid of the dog because it's barking and stuff like that. And then the staff members were reporting back to our caseworker that we were spanking our children um, hard and long or something like that. And we were cussing at them with profanities, calling them little effers. And it's all like, what? We're not doing that. And they said they heard these spankings behind closed doors. And they said they heard um, us call our kids uh, the little effers behind closed doors. And it's all that's like, what, what you guys that's what in the court of law, I'm pretty sure that's what they refer to as hearsay. Yes, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And so, so did and they the ever, were any formal charges ever filed against the stepdad? Nothing was ever, was nope. there an investigation by the police department? Nope. So it's just the child protective services worker that is making all these judgment calls and enforcing all of these rules and requirements. Like yes. She's literally yep. forcing you to leave. And I find it kind of funny i'm not in a funny way but um right she literally took you out of a safe environment and put you forced you into the in exact environment that she was originally accusing you exactly. <laughs> of having your children in exactly and so we my mother-in-law um moved up uh to nebraska before we did and so we were my husband also was accused of falsely accused of sexually abusing a minor when he was 18 so he's he's been he's on the sex offender registry and we've been trying to figure out how to overturn that because i got black and white from the lady that accused him black and white stating that she uh falsely accused him and it's all like okay so but our caseworker when she sent us to this homeless shelter she didn't inform us that he, since his charge he was not allowed to stay at that uh shelter and right. so a couple like maybe a month before we moved up here to nebraska um the shelter was all like oh well you're on this registry you can't stay here so they made my husband get off their property and he was staying in our sleeping in our van in the mental metal the middle of winter in a snowstorm and it's all like what the heck and so we had enough of this and we asked my mother-in-law if we could come up here and she goes yes so we moved up to nebraska it was on a weekend and then by the time uh monday or tuesday hit in march 2020 um the caseworker from colorado informed the uh cps up here they call it dhhs she informed them of our situation and we got a knock at the door by that uh that by that week and it's all like okay and they're like yeah we got a report from colorado that you were calling your kids little effers and they were neglected. And so we had to open up a case uh, for for you guys up here. And so we're like, okay. And the, the caseworker up here that came, um, he immediately told my husband to come into our room and have our son pull down his pants so he could check for bruises. Oh, yeah. And my oh, husband was my like, I'm so comfortable. And he goes, I don't care if you don't, uh, if you don't feel comfortable, you do it or I'm, uh, I'm getting the police involved. So my husband had our son pull down his pants so the caseworker could check for bruises. And it's all like, what the heck? And then he did this twice. The first time he came in contact with us. And then the second time he made our son pull down his pants on our uh, on my mother-in-law's back porch outside wow that's uh that that seems pretty indicative of a sexual assault of sorts exactly and so we worked their case um for about a year you know we um did everything they had family in home therapy or f they call it fct uh, we did that. We graduated with that. We were testing clean on patches, um, which are their drug uh, drug testing um, stuff. 
And so they closed our case out. Everything was fine, dandy. Uh, we moved to North Platte and into our own home. Well, another case gets uh, brought up because some people were reporting, like the, our son's school uh, said that we were sending our son to school in dirty clothes for a week st- straight. And then at the time, there was another report that said, because my our son would empty out the bathtub and empty the conditioner or the shampoo and he would do flips in the tub because we had a big garden tub and so he on one of those occasions he had a scratch on his back from scraping his back uh, on the faucet and the school reported that as oh trying to insinuate that we uh, made those scratches on him and then my daughter she um she's on Ritalin and for her ADHD, and when I had given her her medicine, I handed her pill to her. I set the bottle down on our stove, and my husband had came in. And when I went to go get a, my daughter a glass of water, um, I turned around, and the pill bottle was gone. And I was like, okay. And I just insinuated that, you know, my husband picked it up and put it up in the the cupboard again. No, my daughter swiped it off the um, counter, the stove, and um, she took it to school. So the her school reported us for that. And then they social services said that they were getting calls about them having access to um, like inappropriate videos on the phone. And it's all like, no, there's parental locks on our phone. And I had to do that because... There were some mornings where I would, me and my husband would wake up and our daughter had our phone. So we decided to do the parental, um, parental locks on that. Kids and, are fast and they're sneaky. <laughs> oh yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> and so they got, re- uh, that was reported and the caseworker was like, yeah, we got this report of, you know, the kids having access to inappropriate videos on your phone. And then um, we're like, okay, here's the parental locks. And um, my husband is here. So we did the parental locks and then our caseworker was all like, okay, well, you, uh, can you put on patches? And me and my husband were like, no, because we already proved when we first came up here, we already proved that we weren't drug addicts. And none of these, um, none of these accusations this time were, had nothing to do with drugs. Right. They don't and get so, to just keep harassing you whenever they feel like it. Oh, yeah. And so when we told our caseworker, no, we weren't going to put on your patch because we proved uh, with our case before that we weren't drug addicts. The caseworker told us, um, "Okay, well, I'm going to talk to the county attorney and she's not going to like this um, and she'll probably open up a court case. We're like, "Okay, fine, whatever. Um, And then like three weeks later. Um, they opened up a court case and they removed our children from school without us knowing and then came in, knocked on the door and was all like, oh, by the way, we, uh, your kids are state wards. And I was all like, why? And they're like, it's in the paperwork. They said from 2016 to March, 2022, we put our kids in life-threatening situations. So they went back into our Colorado records that were closed and unfounded, and they used that to remove our kids. And so we, oh yeah. And so we started doing their, you know, jumping through their hoops, visits. We were going to take it to trial for uh, the adjudication part. And the county attorney said, if you take it to trial, it won't be a trial for adjudication. It will be a termination trial right then and there. So they forced wow. us. Oh yeah. oh yeah. So they forced us into a no co- a plea of no contest. And I got it on recording of me when the judge was like, do you uh, agree? And I said, with the no contest. And I said, sure. And the judge was like, no, it's either a yes or no. And I was like, sure. Why not? And she goes, no, it doesn't work that way. You need to say yes or no. And I said, yeah. And so they ordered us to do 
drug patch testing, all mine throughout the whole case. Um, mine were somehow popping for low traces of marijuana. And I don't do that. My husband, he had uh, tr uh, traces of marijuana and he would smoke because he was shot back in 2019 for, uh, and so for his pain, he would do Delta eight because up here in Nebraska, weed is not um, legal. So he would, and the Delta eight is like a synthetic. And so he would do that, but it was nowhere around the children or anything like that. And, but he was still popping hot for marijuana. They uh, started saying that we were doing bad at visit. The kids were scared of us and they had no bond. And it's all like, where are you guys coming up with this? And so we started uh, recording our interactions at visit and they came off with, you know, you need to stop recording. And I said, yeah, but it's all right. And they're like, yeah, it's your right, but um, they don't uh, they don't have to uh, participate in recording. And I was all like, no, we're not going to stop recording because they're telling us we're doing good at visit and then turning around and telling the caseworker we're doing horrible and they're scared to confront us and stuff like that. So right. um, when we told them, no, we're not going to stop recording, they said, OK, we're going to uh, take your visits away. And then we had a family team meeting, and in that family team meeting, the caseworker asked us, what's more important, your rights or your kids? And we said, both. They go hand in hand. They forced my husband to go to drug, drug treatment, and he's been clean since 2019 and because he got shot over it. And they forced him to go to rehab. And in that time fr frame, I lost our house because they they said they would help us uh, help me when he's in rehab with the bills and stuff like that. They never followed through with that. So we lost our house. And in that time frame, uh, my husband, before he went to rehab, he also, you know, tried to commit suicide also. So they ripped our visits away for like three, three weeks. And then they also um didn't have a support worker company those are the people that monitor our visits and then they tr our caseworker tried saying you know oh i refused visits um and it's like no i didn't the fact is you guys did not have a support worker company to do visits and then on top of that of him being in rehab they um they said that I was popping hot for methamphetamines. And I was like, I've never done meth in my life. So you guys, your patches are unreliable. And they're like, oh, you must have uh, taken it. And it's all like, no, I don't do drugs. And uh, I, I kept on telling my attorney, you know, this is wrong. You know, they're accusing me of doing drugs and stuff like that. I'm not doing them. And they're like, well, the patch doesn't lie. And it's all like, you guys are either tampering with them or something because we don't do drugs. We got in trouble for um, us losing our house. I had a tax return um, and me and my husband paid three months worth of rent and three months of uh, utilities. And then we bought the kids their Christmas presents and then we bought us a TV, a sound bar and a stereo system. And they reported that back with, oh, they spent their money foolishly. And we all did any of their business how you exactly. spend your money, anyways. Exactly. And then we I also like bought they need to know their place because that exactly. ain't it. <laughs> exactly. And then we bought two houses up in uh, Auburn, Nebraska. And we, uh, you know, one house was livable, and then one house was a total remodel. It's not livable. Well, they told us that they were not transferring our case. And so we, me and my husband had these two properties and two houses that we couldn't do anything with them because they would not um, transfer our case up there. And so we had to sell our trailers because of them. And then also with the losing our house that we were renting, we lost that because they were be uh, I was behind on bills when my husband went up to rehab. 
So we had to come down here and uh, move back in with my mother-in-law. They, um, throughout this whole case, we've seen multiple bruises in unexplained places. Like there was bruises on my daughter's arms, legs, back, her side. One of the bruises looks like a boot print on her side. And we reported that and they're like, oh, it's just normal childhood bruising. It's so like, no, these children, when they were in our care, they never had this many uh, bruising. Right. And then <clears throat> about, I think, November, December, our daughter did the international help pain <laughs> sign where she goes like this mm -hmm. because um, we we're doing video visitation because they didn't have two support workers to do, supervise our visits. And so me and my husband caught the help hand sign she was doing on recording, on a screen record, and we turned it into the Nebraska State Patrol. The Nebraska State Patrol went and uh, did their little investigation and they said, oh, there's no abuse going here or going on. And it's all like, how? trial was december 5th through the 8th um of last year and they uh, our termination trial and they all through the tr trial there was lies they um me and my husband are part of the nebraska um constitutional militia um you know tr to stand up for our rights other people's rights you know stuff like that and they brought that up in the trial they kept on saying oh militia members are violent why are you in a militia don't you think this is inappropriate for the kids to be around militia this militia that and um at one point one of our attorneys goes well um i think this is a personal vendetta they crucified us but they really put me up on the cross and turned it upside down and made me look like a scarecrow because it was a pure vendetta with me because of drug use and alcohol abuse through my, almost my entire life and i thought that was ridiculous then they made a claim that my mom was a gang member which is inaccurate i was the gang member <clears throat> they just they literally crucified us and made us look to be like the most worst parents there are due to and, mental and regardless of that like there are very specific laws put into place like you're you don't remove a child from their parents care unless there is evidence of abuse like yep. and and it's not even just any abuse to be technical like it has to be something happening to where their life is in imminent danger then and only then are they supposed to just come in and remove your children yeah the biggest thing i found fault was is they, they said from 2016 till 22 2022. 2022 we put them in life-threatening situations okay well that's inaccurate because on august 23rd of 2019 i was shot six times by my drug dealer my wife nor my kids were around i was the only one that got shot but that got thrown in my face immediately that oh you put him in danger no no i didn't like i i regret ever having exposed them to that but i never they never actually got to see me being shot i was alone in the middle of the night getting shot so for them to say oh well you did this is completely inaccurate and through this year and a half, I, this is my personal opinion. I've watched our lawyers that are sworn to protect us, literally get it, let us get trampled over and not say a thing about it. Or when we do say something about it, they proceed to go into the blame game of, oh, you didn't do this. You didn't do that. And it's all, okay, why don't you say that with your chest this time? Right. But it, it's hard. It's, it's, it's their job to defend you and it's their job to stand up for you and to make sure that the courts aren't taking advantage of you and breaking the law like they repeatedly do. Yeah, in our termination paperwork, because they uh, the judge finally made her decision after three months since the trial, because our trial was in December and we got the termination order March 5th. Uh, but in the termination paperwork, the they made to they made it a point to throw it in there that 
we said or we told them that the militia will overthrow the government. And that's never came out of our mouths before. And it's all like, you guys are... Which regard, even then, it's freedom of speech. Exactly. I mean, that's, you don't get to, you know, hold somebody accountable for using their, their rights. So was, was the incident that had happened with, uh, with the shooting, that was far before all of this took place, correct? Yes, correct. Was that in another state? Yes, it was in Colorado. And there was an investigation with CPS there after that shooting, correct? Yes, it was the investigation with CPS when she came in uh, to the house was January 2022. I or 2020, was it 2020? Yeah, January 2020 is when they did an investigation and was all like, oh, you need to move to the homeless shelter. And then they didn't even do a freaking uh, investigation. They just came in and freaking sat there and was like, oh, this is the allegations. Right. And they jumped like, through their hoops and they closed that case out. Yep. So, so we, what makes this new state then uh, think that they that what they just get to jump in and take over jurisdiction for, <laughs> for exactly. something that was closed? Exactly. That's just it, crazy. It this whole thing has been just a giant mess. And then me and another gal we wrote a letter to the editor and they used that in our trial they um they stalk my facebook and my tiktok accounts uh, the foster dad stalks my face um not my facebook but my tiktok account and went and would tell the dhhs people you know oh this is what's being posted on tiktok and then our one of the caseworkers would get on my <clears throat> facebook account and not like my actual Facebook account, but my Facebook and screenshot um, stuff that I had put like during our trial, I had three shirts made, one for me, one for my husband and one for my mother-in-law. And it had our kids' picture on it and it said justice for Triton and Hazlin. And then on the back, it said, hashtag save our children. Well, they Spun it around. The caseworker, one of the caseworkers, got on my Facebook, screenshotted what I posted. Was does anybody know how to make uh, T-shirts? And so they screenshotted it and was trying to say that we got the shirts made to sell to other people. It doesn't and it's even all, make any sense. Exactly. And it's all like, where are you pulling this out of? Because that's not ex that's not what happened. We got three shirts made for our personal use. Which regardless, again, what business is it of theirs? Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> like instance after instance, they're just dropping the ball, you know, and it's it's such a shame that so many court systems not only allow a child protective services agency to get away with things like this. It's almost like a lot of court systems encourage it, you know, exactly. and it's, and it just, it's to, all it's doing is destroying these children that they exactly. vowed to protect. Exactly. That is so true. Yeah. And I, I, I made a Facebook group for, um, it's called Nebraska parents against dhhs corruption i believe that's what it's called and i Make made sure that. they have something good to look at if they're gonna stalk your shit <laughs> exactly and i made that for parents to come to vent and stuff like that and it's set for a private group so that way dhhs and cps don't interfere and because a lot of the parents are scared to come forward absolutely yeah, I have uh, I have several different people that I've worked with that, you know, desperately want to do a podcast and tell their story, but they're just too afraid to mm -hmm. or their attorney is suggesting that they not. And mm -hmm. a lot of these people are still in the middle of their court. I mean, yours just recently ended. And yeah. I mean, how many years do they harass you for before it's finally done? You know, 
Now, the one thing I do got to say is through this year and a half of literal living hell, I've I made five attempts on my own life. The first one was more of a mistake because, you know, the panic attacks, the PTSD are, I don't call it PTSD. It's not a disorder. It's a post-traumatic response. And I've, and I took too much medicine, plus I was drinking, but then I was only 29 years old and I had a literal heart attack while I was putting gas in our car. And I had what was, what is known as the Widowmaker, one of my arteries. And then the last attempt I made was a true, I'm going to just end it now because I am sick of this. And I drank close to a suitcase of beer. And then I started downing uh, gabapentin, uh, Minpress, and I can't remember what else, but I had taken almost half of each bottle and they were the big bottles. By the time the cops came, I had already ingested half of those bottles. Mm. And then um, they- I'm grateful you're still here to, to share your story and- and the thing that really irritated me was it was immediate. Oh, well, you're unstable. You you tried to take your life. It's all. Well, I wonder why you've ripped everything away from me and you expect me to sit here and smile at you. Right. But yeah. I want that to be very well known that there are parents still to this day that are trying to take their lives or have successfully done it because Absolutely. of these monsters. Uh, it's the same thing with children. A lot of children yep. do the same too. When they end up in foster care, they end up runaways. They end up in the yep. in the sex industry, and it's. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, family courts are just destroying lives all exactly. the way around. Yep. And there's no accountability. There's no due process. Yep. And it's it's violating multiple constitutional rights. I mean. And and it's across all laws, whether it's your constitutional or federal or state, upon every single level, the laws specifically and very clearly say that removing a child from a parent's care is the last resort exactly. that they are supposed to pursue. They are supposed to make an extreme effort to repair and fix. Yep and help exactly. and then if the parents refuse that help then you know whatever it goes from there but that's just i am so sorry y'all had to experience that heartbreak our lawyers were saying oh don't do don't get on social media don't do any interviews don't go to the news don't do that don't do that and so like what are you guys hiding what do you they want to keep you silenced yep and it's all like this is they our children aren't even with family because we tried and tried and tried and tried to get them with family they didn't even uh follow the rules or the regulations on placing our kids with family members first yes that is a law if parents are not an option the next thing they have, they are required by law to try to place the children with relatives. Yep. And that was shot down because uh, my husband's dad tried getting them. My adopted mom tried getting them. I tried to get them. My, my mother-in-law tried getting them. My cousin in Colorado tried getting them. And it was immediate yeah. shot down. Wow. That is just disgusting. Oh, yeah. I bugged and bugged and bugged. To get and they get. were nitpicking like they're like oh you don't you guys don't ha uh, when we were trying to uh, when we got visitation in our house they nitpicked they're like oh well your house stinks there's a, a smoke smell like cigarette smoke smell there's uh you you guys don't have any fire uh extinguishers there's no fire alarms um stuff like that and it's all like you guys are really nitpicking and that, well that's illegal again that's not their place as long as it's a safe place for the kids to be and they can provide the basic needs of the child that is their only concern that they need to be worrying about is if them children are going to be safe and taken care of oh yeah and there's what a place smells like oh yeah and they even uh, was all like oh well before we could approve the visits to be in uh, my mother-in-law's house we need all the animals shot records it's all like, I've never heard of that before, ever. 
just going out of their way to try to complicate things and make things as difficult as they can. Yes, very much so. And according to our team that was on our um, on our case, like our caseworker and our um, lawyers and the family support workers, they were like, oh, well, we're terrified of um, your husband. But it was funny because they never explained that to us or they never brought it up to our attention. And every time we'd be all like, hey, how are visits going? They're, the support workers that supervised our visits were all like, it's going good. We have no concerns. And then come family team meeting time, this is when all concerns will get brought up. And it's all like, how can we know what we're doing wrong and what we need to correct if you don't tell us right then and there? Right. For sure. Why do we have to wait until a month later at a family team meeting to hear these concerns? Well, you would think that they would want to address concerns quickly and openly so that way everybody is on the same page and that's what would benefit the children. If there's a problem, then, hey, let's talk about it and figure out better ways that makes everybody exactly. happy. Exactly. And their, their uh, parental assessment or their psychological evaluation, that guy, he wasn't even in the state of Nebraska. He lives in Iowa and practices in Iowa and he's retired and we had to do it over Zoom. So we had to do a parenting assessment slash psychological evaluation. This guy, let me tell you, he's a quack because he lied in his report saying that Casey is very much codependent on her husband. She, if he if he does something, she'll follow. And it's all like, where are you getting this stuff from? Now, was he working with your children or was he working directly with you? He was di uh, working directly with me and my husband because we had to do the psychological evaluation and a parenting assessment. So he did the parenting assessment over phone where we had to uh, interact with our kids on visit and he was watching through a phone. That's a pretty strong and bold assertion to make with only having telephone communication with somebody for a brief amount of time. Exactly. Exactly. And he's all like, well, they it's a concern if the kids ever get returned to them, uh, they would be in danger. And it's all like, how are you a fortune teller? <laughs> like, how can you tell? Like, you're just assuming. Well, there were never any charges to begin with that, that involved nope. anything that was directly <laughs> harming your children regardless exactly and that and then they put us uh they put us both on the child abuse and neglect registry which i would i used to do home health care and i used to uh, do work in daycares well if i wanted to go back to daycare or doing jobs in daycares or home health care i can't do that because i'm on that abuse and neglect registry no did they charge you mm -hmm. They didn't charge us, but so they how are they putting forcing you on a registry if you've never been charged with <laughs> any kind of abuse or exactly that that's that's what we don't understand. It's all like we've never been criminally charged, and but yet you're going to put our names on a abuse abuse and neglect registry. Wow. That's just crazy to me. Like, I can't even, I mean, the reach and the power and the authority that these people are given with zero oversight, zero accountability. Like, I mean, these people have the power to just completely destroy anybody's life that they want in the blink yes. of an eye with, I mean, and they can just do it. It doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. Yep. And we even, they've, they have harassed us like in that small group that I was talking to you about on Facebook, there's a couple of ladies that um, I talk to on a regular basis and stuff like that. And then our militia commander before trial, I think it was in November before trial uh, of last year, we like me, my husband, my mother-in-law, 
our militia commander and two other two or three other gals all got threatening text messages and that were like they were trying to portray as an FBI agent and saying that our phones were being monitored and that um, they're they're in hiding be, uh, because they've been trying to expose CPS and they followed. It, it's nuts what these uh, what these text messages said, and <laughs> we reported that and nothing was done. Um, and then my I I have four binder fulls of evidence against them and three thumb drives. When we moved back with my mother-in-law, I keep my thumb drives in my purse. And I let uh, that day, I left my purse in the car. And I went out to get my purse, and my purse wasn't there. And I was like, where the heck is my purse? I know I left it in here. And my husband's like, are you sure you didn't bring it in? And I said, I'm sure. I left it right here in the car. So I reported my uh, purse being, uh, being missing. Well, a week later, I find my purse... Uh, down the alleyway by our neighbor's trash can, it was rummaged through. Nothing was taken out of it, but it was rummaged through. And so, like, what are you guys? What were you guys trying to get or freaking access or what were you guys doing? Were your drives still in there? Yep, our drives were still in there. So my, I'm guessing they probably had like the computer and uh, a computer and put put it in the computer and downloaded that because. I, I can't explain, you know, why would somebody take my purse, rummage through it, but not take anything? Did you and, check the drives to see if all the files were still on it? Yep. And they were still on there. And so I'm all like, okay, this does not make sense. And then we did a couple motions. Me and my husband did a couple motions to the court. And we had copies of the motions that we uh, sent to the court. Um, and they were in our car and somebody went through our car, rummaged through all our legal paper, but didn't, um, didn't take anything. So my husband called the cops and the cop was like, this is the first I've never seen anything like this, you know, and I could tell your papers were rummaged through and it's all like, okay, this doesn't make sense. You know, my our friend, she she was dealing with DHHS, and she got her kids back, thank God. But um, since then, she's been harassed by the police. She's been harassed and followed. We all have been followed by their black or white SUVs with tinted out windows. Mm -hmm. It's all like, are they intimidating us, or what are they doing? Yeah, I've, I've that's not the first time I've heard of that. It's it seems to be a, um, a pretty scary scenario that's happening nationwide with a lot of oh, yeah. these yes workers. And you know, I mean, they've somebody needs to put them in check because exactly this just in the United States in the year 2024 for us to have problems and complications like this you know, at all, much less when it comes to our children, you know, yes. it, it blows my mind. I mean, the more, the more that I, you know, do this series and get involved with this, this series and speaking with people, it's just, you know, you think you heard it all and then you talk to somebody else and oh, yes. it just blows your mind. It does. It blew our mind. And, you know, we don't know if we will get to have a goodbye visit with our kids because nobody has, we were promised a goodbye visit if termination happened and termination did, they found uh, they, the courts ordered that and we still haven't had a goodbye visit. It's been seven days since we saw our kids last and their toys go untouched and it's just sickening. And I am so, so sorry you guys have to go through this. It's it's uh, illegal. What they are doing is illegal. And uh, yes. your, your rights have most certainly been uh, repeatedly and consistently violated. And oh, yes, I'm hopefully uh, I mean, I don't unfortunately have the power to do a whole lot, but uh, I, I do have a big mouth and a platform. <laughs> so. We're going to use what we got. And, yes. Uh, 
<laughs> do what we can anyways. And, you know, hopefully somebody will see this and, you know, be able to offer some help or something, but I, somebody has got to start standing up and doing something. Oh, yeah. I mean, there's got to be a group of attorneys out there that are just like, man, have you, oh, yeah. we should do something guys, <laughs> you know, exactly. like exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, they go after people that can't afford their own lawyers. And it's Absolutely. really sick. Well, you know, to be honest with you, the, the more that I've been researching and digging into things, even just locally in my area, unfortunately, a lot of times the attorneys are all in on it too. They're all buddy yep. buddies and exactly. they all play golf together and eat dinner together and have drinks together. And they yep. all know and they all conspire amongst themselves with, hmm, how do we want this case to play out? You know, yep, exactly. Essentially how it's turning out to be. Yes. And it's all sick. It makes us sick to our stomach. Well, I really appreciate you sharing your story with me and uh, make sure that you, you know, keep me updated and such. Are, are, so moving forward, are y'all going to like keep trying we're to gonna, file things in court? And Yep. We're going to appeal uh, the situation, uh, the order, but our attorneys are like, it feels like that they're not wanting to the, do the appeal because from the, when the time the judge gave the order of termination, you had 30 days after that date. And we're coming on a week without them giving us any notice of saying, you know, hey, we're going to start the appeals process. We're going to give them notice that we're starting an appeal, da 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 blah, blah. Nothing. It's, it's almost like they just found their way out of this court case right to just ignore hear, like, it and pretend yeah. like it didn't happen exactly and on to the next victim and it's all like no 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 i sat in with a gal uh, i think it was a week two weeks ago at her court date and <clears throat> the gal's attorney was is my husband's attorney public defender and my husband's the little gal's um a public defender pulled the little gal out of the courthouse or the courtroom and asked the little gal to ask me to leave. And it's wow. like, oh yeah. And I didn't get, cause I had my phone turned off. So I didn't get her message from uh, the little gal's message. And so I didn't get that until I left the courthouse after her court was done. And I get a message on my phone on Facebook that says my my public defender asked me to ask you to leave. And so wow. I'm like, why? Why? This is a public, this is a public place. I'm not being disruptive. I'm just listening. Yeah, they sure do like to think that they just make up their own laws and follow the rules that they choose. Exactly. <laughs> Gosh, that's just, I can't even imagine. I mean, going through, you know, my court process, I've, you know, had my own drama and, and, and troubles. However, it's, you know, I'm, I'm very lucky and I'm very fortunate that, you know, my situation was not nearly as bad as, as it could have been. Uh, right. Not from lack of their trying, <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but, you know, I mean, these courts have to start getting to the point where, I mean, they're going to start messing with these families that, they're the fuck around and find out type and exactly. they, you know, they're going to stand up to you. And all it takes sometimes is that one, you know, for yep. everything to just come crashing down. So exactly. So I, I, I pray that uh, you guys are successful in, in your appeal and, and that you get your case properly heard and uh, taken care of. Well, thank you. Yeah, for sure. And anytime that you want to come back on or whatever, just let me know. We can do another podcast anytime. We'd love to have you back on sometime. Yes, thank you very much. And thank you for having us. Yeah, for sure. Anytime. Have a great day. You too. Bye. Bye.